Well, good morning, everyone. Morning. And good morning to everyone that is uh, joining us uh, online. It's good to have each and every one of you with us this morning. If you would open your Bibles to the book of First Peter. First Peter chapter 4. And we're going to start off with a reading of God's Word as we do every Sunday morning. And it says this, starting in verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep her fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a spiritual gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards and the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us bow. Father, we thank you for allowing us to meet. And Lord, we pray this morning that you take away any thing that is clouding our minds that would keep us from you. Father, remove whatever obstacles may be in our way that we may concentrate on the word that you have uh, purposed for pastor to preach. And Father, we pray that if there is anyone out there, Lord, either online or here present, that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that today may be the day of salvation for them. Oh, Father, may your Spirit come upon them and change their hearts and their minds, that they may confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in their hearts that you, Father, raised them from the dead. For we serve a living Christ. And Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. And we pray in the holy name of our Lord and Savior, his name is Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to start off with some really good news. On March 14th, does anybody know what's happening on March 14th? We're having a small uh, gathering, celebration uh, of, I believe, 35 years. 35 years that, that God has kept this church, the church doors open here at this church in La Puente. And throughout all, all I, I just want to say too, also, it's March 14th after service. I also want to take this time to, to thank the congregation, the people who come here. Throughout this pandemic, throughout this the things that the ups and downs that we've gone through in 2020, beginning of 2021. You know, there are many churches that closed or haven't reopened. Mm -hmm. There are many things that have happened in God's places of worship. But thanks to you all, these doors have been kept open. So on behalf of the, the, the executive board, thank you all. Thank you, God. Thank you very much for giving to God's purpose. For we know that even though things happen, the bills still have to be paid. So thank you so much, and uh, thank you. We also, uh, as our usual uh, announcements, Ladies Prayer Group still meets Tuesday nights, 6 p.m. See me for, um, for the link to get on there. Uh, it's headed by uh, my wife, Lydia Caracosa. Uh, Sunday School with Robert Smith. It's actually more of a Sunday Bible school, Sunday Bible lesson. Robert does a tremendous, tremendous job 
of deciphering and, 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 and letting us know what certain words mean so that we can get an accurate reading of God's word and know what God is saying. Not what we think he's saying, but what God is saying. Uh, so Sunday school, that's also a, a Zoom meeting. And uh, the um, announcement that Liz has sent out has a link to it. Wednesday night Bible study. Pastor is going through the book of Philippians. And uh, you can either come in person or you can view it online. So Wednesday night Bible studies. Also there's uh, someone we forgot to pray for. Uh, we still have our sister Bean Bendrano. Uh, we have, uh, I, I haven't gotten any updates on our brother Johnny Salazar. But also we have our brother Ronnie Rodriguez who was recently in the hospital and was released. He's home now, but he's going to through some, some stuff that uh, I, I, I'm not at liberty to say, you know, if, uh, if anyone wants to reach out, give him a call, give him a text, encourage them. Above all, you know, lift them up in your prayers. That would be, you know, that would be nice. So let us bow right now and, and let's pray for our, our sick. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all who are, are here today. And collectively, Lord, we lift up our hearts and our prayers to you, Lord, that you may be with our sister B. Medrano, with Johnny Salazar, with Ronnie Rodriguez, and others, Lord, who are ill. And Father, that you be with them, that your comfort and your peace surround them. And Father, above all, that they may glorify you in all that they do and all that they're going through. And Father, we ask you to strengthen them and to heal them. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. With that, Pastor. Well, good morning to you. Morning. Praise the Lord for all of you. Do we have any visitors with us this morning for the very first time? It's good to see Richard again. Amen. Amen. All right. Big, big round of applause. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare ourselves to look at Luke chapter 3. Our Father, we come before you and pray that you would open our hearts and speak to us, Lord, wonderful things from your word this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 3. Verse 21. <clears throat> now, Luke chapter 1 and 2 deal with preliminary issues regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there's a 30 year silence. A 30 year silence. 30 years of silent years where we don't know a whole lot about him. We know that he was the carpenter's son. Nothing more is known about him. And then all of a sudden in Luke chapter 3, he enters in to his, his uh, three-year public ministry. And he claims to be the Son of God. Go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse 2. Isaiah 53, verse 2. This could describe his first 30 years. He 
He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. Here it is. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. So in other words, there was nothing special about his appearance. He didn't have a stately form or majesty. Nothing that we would be attracted to him. In other words, he looked like an average Jewish male. And then he burst on the scene and claims to be the Messiah. He claims to be the Son of God. Now a lot of people could do that. A lot of people could claim to be something special. So what we're going to look at this morning are three confirmations of Jesus' credentials. How do we know that Jesus was who he claimed to be? He's claiming to be the Messiah. He's claiming to be the Christ, the Savior of the world. How do we know he is who he claims to be? Well, I want to set before you, and there are many more, but just for the sake of this message, three confirmations of his credentials. Chapter 3 of Luke, verse 21, is the first. And this is a very public confirmation by God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. Now, this was John's baptism. This was a baptism of repentance from sin. Why was Jesus baptized? He was baptized because he was identifying himself with sinful men. That is why he came to this earth. He came to identify with sinners and he came to pay the penalty for their sin. So we see here that Jesus was baptized and while he was praying, something dramatic happens. Heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. So the Holy Spirit physically descended upon him in front of all the people. And a voice came out of heaven saying, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. So here we have the beautiful picture of the Trinity. We have God the Son being baptized. God the Holy Spirit physically descending upon him, filling him. And God the Father publicly declaring his love and approval. So this was a very public confirmation by God the Father and God the Holy Spirit regarding God the Son and His ministry. And all the people around, they witnessed and they heard this. So this is the first confirmation. Now the second is a... So this was a public confirmation. The second is a legal confirmation. If you claim to be someone, you need to prove your genealogy. You need to prove your genealogy. 
Now we have in Luke chapter 3 verse 23, Luke's genealogy. Matthew chapter 1, there's another genealogy. What is a genealogy? A genealogy is a list of your descendants. Now the Messiah had to prove direct descent from two very specific people. King David, King David, the Messiah would come through King David's line. And Abraham, the Messiah would be a part of the family of Abraham, the Jewish race. So we have two genealogies, one in Matthew, one in Luke, tracing the descendants of Jesus back to their appropriate places. Now there's a problem here though. There, well, it's not a problem. Look at Matthew. Look at Matthew's genealogy. Matthew 1, verse 16. Matthew 1, 16. Now it's interesting, Matthew's genealogy starts with Abraham and descends all the way to Jesus. Luke's genealogy starts with Jesus and goes all the way back to Adam. Why the differences? Well, Matthew's audience was Jewish. Luke's audience was Gentile. So Luke traces the line of Christ all the way back to Adam. It is a more universal appeal that Luke is taking. Now, here is... Here is uh, it looks like a discrepancy. Just stay with me right here. This is kind of getting into the weeds. But Matthew 1.16, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. So here, Jesus' grandfather is who? Well, Joseph was his legal father. Jacob is Jesus' grandfather. Right? Now, you go to Luke. And there's a different name right here. And all the critics salivate at stuff like this. They say, well, there's errors right here. Go to Luke. Chapter 3, verse 23. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age. Being as was supposed, the son of Joseph... The son of Eli. So, Matthew names Jesus' grandfather as Jacob, and Luke names Jesus' grandfather as Eli. Two different names. Is there a mistake here? No, there's two different genealogies. Matthew traces the genealogy through Joseph. And even though Joseph was not his biological father, he was his legal father, thereby giving Jesus legal claim, Luke's genealogy traces it through Mary, thereby giving Jesus racial claim. So you've got legal claim and racial claim. They're two different genealogies. Now, we know that the Messiah had to come through the line of David. And here we see a couple differences also. Look at Luke. I think you're there. Chapter 3, verse 31. 331. 
the son of Malaya, the son of Mena, the son of Mataliah, the son of Nathan, the son of David. Remember, the Messiah had to trace his lineage through David, King David, because Second Samuel, there's a prophecy there that the Messiah would come through his line. So David had a lot of sons. His most famous son was Solomon, but he had another son named Nathan. And that's the son listed here. Mary came through the line of David through Nathan. Now, we won't read it, but Matthew talks about... Well, you know, I think we will read it. Matthew 1, verse 6. Matthew 1, verse 6. And then we're going to get out of this uh, little detailed part here. Matthew 1, verse 6. Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba. So Matthew's genealogy traces the line of Joseph through Solomon to David. Luke traces the line of Jesus from Nathan to David. So David had a number of sons, Solomon and Nathan were two of them. And Joseph comes through Solomon and Mary comes through Nathan, but they both come through David. So, are you thoroughly confused? <laughs> We are looking at the legal confirmation of the Messiah. Now, on a more practical level, let's look at this next one. The moral confirmation. If Jesus was the Messiah, he had to be sinless. So the Holy Spirit sends him out into the wilderness to do battle alone with the devil. And the devil is given free access to Jesus for 40 days and tempts him and tempts him and tempts him nonstop. And Jesus is doing battle against Satan. And if he is the Messiah, he has to be victorious. So the Holy Spirit sends Jesus out there to do battle against Satan to prove that he's the Messiah, sinless and victorious. Now Luke chapter 4 verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from, returned from the Jordan, and he was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. That's amazing. And I'm hungry now. <laughs> 40 days he didn't eat. So why 40 days? Well, I don't know for sure, but I know Moses had a 40 day period of fasting. And Elijah had a 40-day period of fasting. And the nation of Israel had a 40-year period of wilderness wandering. So, uh, something about the number 40. So the Spirit of God leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Those temptations are evil, but they become testing to prove his credentials. If you're the Son of God, if you're the Messiah, if you're the Christ, you will be victorious over the devil. So Satan tempts him. Now we can learn some things from this. The first temptation, very specifically for the Messiah, but also we can apply it to our own lives. 
We can apply it to our own lives. The first temptation comes at him like this. Satan tempted Christ to doubt God's love. To doubt God's love. Verse 3. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. If you are the Son of God, this is the way your Father treats you? Forty days without food? I mean, He fed the rebellious nation of Israel for 40 years. He fed them. And you're His Son? And He hasn't provided any food for you? He must not love you. If He loved you, you wouldn't be going through this trial. He must not love you. If you're His Son, why are you being treated this way? Take matters into your own hands. Turn that stone into a Big Mac and eat it. You can't trust God. You got to take matters into your own hands. You got to use your power and turn the stone into food. God doesn't love you. If He loved you, you wouldn't be going through this. Look at you. You're the Son of God. You're out here in the wilderness with me. You haven't eaten for 40 days. God doesn't really love you, does He? Now, we can identify with that, can't we? Because when you go through trials, when you go through a really hard time, you say, I wonder if God really loves me. If He really loves me, He wouldn't, per he wouldn't have permitted me to be going through this painful situation. How did Jesus respond? It is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Man shall not live on bread alone. And Matthew says, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. Matthew adds that. In other words, I don't live on bread alone. My life is not based simply on my physical needs. I live in the realm of faith. I live in absolute trust in God. Whether He feeds me or whether I starve, I still have faith in God. Look at Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. I like these young teenagers right here. They demonstrate this. Daniel 3 verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and anger gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men were brought before the king. They're young men. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up. Now, if you are ready at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, tigron, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, fall down and worship the image I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Now that was an intimidating encounter. Nebuchadnezzar is the most powerful man in the world. 
And he's very angry at you. And he has the power of life and death in his hands. I mean, he is worshipped as God. Look at the calmness of the young men. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if, even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. If he delivers us, fine. If he doesn't deliver us, fine. Our lives are in his hands and we're not going to worship. We're not going to bow down. We're not going to serve your gods. We have absolute faith in our God. Whether he, whether he feeds us or whether he doesn't. Our faith is unshakable. That's what is meant by man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So, Satan tempted Christ to doubt God's love. When you go through inexplicable trials, when you go through difficult times, never doubt the love of God. He may be testing you. He may have a, a bigger purpose for your life. Jesus basically said, I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. I'm not going to turn the stone into bread so I can satisfy my hunger. I'm going to allow my Father to feed me. I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. I'm not. You know, when you take matters into your own hands, things go bad. Wait for God to answer. Now, here's another temptation. Luke 4, Luke 4 verse 5. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory for it has been handed over to me for it has been handed over to me it's mine to give I will give it to whomever, to whomever I wish therefore if you worship before me it shall be yours I'll give it to you all the kingdoms and the world and their glory are yours for the asking. All you've got to do is bow down and worship me. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, this temptation, Satan tempted Christ to doubt God's plan. In the first temptation, Satan tempted Christ to doubt God's love. And now he's tempting him to doubt God's plan. God has a plan for his son. And what is that plan? Well, let's look at look at Psalm chapter 2. This is the plan that he has for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 2, verse 8. Psalm 2, verse 8. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. All the nations are going to bow down and worship you. Daniel, go to Daniel.
chapter 7, verse 13. Seven thirteen. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. Who is the son of man? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's the son of man. One like the son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days. Who's that? That's the father. And was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. That all the peoples, nations, men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So, he's going to get a kingdom. And all the peoples, nations, and tongues are going to bow down to him. So when Satan offers him that, he's tempting Christ to doubt God's plan. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the thing. God's plan is for his son to have a kingdom where he will be worshipped universally. But before the crown is the cross. Before the glory is suffering. Jesus must first go to the cross suffer and die and then he will receive glory and a kingdom and exaltation but all of that comes after the cross Satan says you don't have to go to the cross I'll give it to you now I'll give it to you right now I'll give you the I'll give you the kingdoms of the world and their glory you don't have to go to the cross I'll give you a shortcut to glory. Oh, beware of the shortcuts. Philippians chapter 2 talks about God's sequence here. First the cross, then the crown. Philippians 2 verse 6. This is the plan of God for who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. Here's his descent. And being made in the likeness of men, he was found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And after that, for this reason also, here we have his exaltation. God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So his descent and his exaltation. That's the plan of God. Satan says, I'll give it to you without the cross. Now, interesting little question here. Was that a legitimate offer Satan offered him or was he lying? Now, we know that Satan is the God of this world. Does he have the power to give to Christ all the kingdoms of the world and their glory? We know that he controls this world. But he doesn't have absolute power. He is an egotistical, arrogant liar. He's the father of lies. He's full of pride and self-deception. He probably thinks he has the power and he's offering Christ the kingdom of the world. So beware of the shortcut. The shortcut. Beware of the great 
deceiver tempting you to pursue the shortcut. I was thinking about a practical application. I'm thinking about human relationships. You know, a lifelong, stable marriage relationship. How does that happen? Well, it takes months and years to develop. You've got to be, you know, before you get married, you've got to be friends. You've got to have some courtship. You've got to be engaged. Then you get married. It's a slow progression of intimacy that ends up in, st- in a stable, lifelong relationship. Now, why don't relationships last very long anymore? Because people take the shortcut, instant intimacy. You are intimate on the second date. Instant. That's the shortcut. And that's why the relationship fizzles out. Because you took the shortcut. You didn't lay the foundation. You didn't... You see, Jesus said uh, the plan for Christ was was uh, the crown, glory, but first the cross. In relationships, you gotta, you got to lay the foundations that sometimes, sometimes there's pain and suffering. You've got to get through hardships. You've got to prove the relationship can go the distance. Beware of shortcuts. We are a society that wants... We want things now. We want them right now. Everything instant. Instant. And that's why... That's why young women don't know how to cook anymore. Because they were raised on Pop-Tarts. And microwave oven things. And McDonald's. They don't know how to put together home cooked meal because their mothers don't know. Grandma knows, but she's checked out a long time ago. She knows, but she didn't pass on the she didn't pass on the, the magic. Can't even cook beans anymore. It's all instant. Can you make a homemade pie? Why? You got Marie Callender's. <laughs> oh, Satan is the temptation is, is uh, doubting God's plan. Now, here's the third temptation. The, fir- the first temptation, Satan tempts Christ to doubt God's love. And to doubt God's plan. And thirdly, Satan tempted Christ to trust God presumptuously. Verse uh, cha- Luke chapter 4 verse 9. Luke 4 verse 9. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand at the pinnacle of the temple. That's quite a drop off. If you fall, you're going to die. Pinnacle of the temple at 700 feet down. Way down in the Kindred Valley. And he said to him, All right, you trust God, obviously. You're a big truster of God. Jump. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You trust in God? Jump. 
He'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. Presumptuous. That word means overconfident. Inappropriate confidence. Taking liberties with God's grace. Don't be presumptuous. Don't put the Lord your God to the test. What would have happened if Jesus had jumped? Well, he, one, he would have died. Or, he would have forced the Father to rescue him. He would have forced his Father's hand to rescue him. Now that, think about that. If Jesus had jumped, he would have forced his Father to rescue him. That would have created division in the Trinity. You can't have that. Christ had submitted himself to the Father's will. And if he would have jumped, he would have been defying the Father's will. He would have been tempting the love of God or displaying lack of love. Distrust in the Father's love. Now this is a very subtle temptation. This encourages people to act arrogantly and test God. And that's why it says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. I knew a, I knew a, stra a former alcoholic, a former alcoholic, a, a problem drinker. God saved him out of that lifestyle. And he got this idea to go into bars and witness to people. Now on the surface, that, that sounds like he's really trusting God. But it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. Because that alcohol has a way of drawing you back. I knew another guy, he couldn't even collect cans. Because the smell of the alcohol in a, in a used up beer can stimulated his, his, his mind. He couldn't do that. That is testing the Lord. Don't put the Lord your God to the test. Now, let's put all these together. How to be victorious over temptation. By the way, is temptation sin? No. Temptation is not sin. Jesus was tempted. Temptation is Satan knocking on the door. Let me in. Let me in. Let me in. No. That's, that's temptation. Sin is opening the door. Don't open the door. You're going to get tempted. We all get tempted. How to overcome temptation? Well, look at Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. That's it. How to overcome and be victorious over temptation. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be submitted to the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Allow the Spirit of God that lives within you to have complete control over your life. Here's another suggestion. Focus on the battle. Verse 2, for 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he had nothing to eat during those days. Sometimes a period of fasting clarifies your mind. Sometimes when you don't have food on board, your mind is clear. Focus on the battle. Maybe don't eat as much. Maybe go without food a little bit so that you can be more focused. You can see Satan coming at you from the left or from the right because you're more focused, you're more clear minded. You're not overloaded with food. So next time you're given a, a bag of little sugar-coated donuts, 
Don't eat the whole bag. Maybe cut one in half and have it. Done. One and done. One and done. Focus on the battle. We get so focused on our physical needs, we're unaware that we're being attacked spiritually until it's too late. Here's another suggestion. Know the Word of God. You notice in, in chapter 4, verse 4, And Jesus answered him, It is written. And then he quotes a verse. He quotes Deuteronomy. Man shall not live on bread alone. Where does that come from? Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 3. Jesus quotes a verse. And then, and then uh, look at verse 8. Jesus answered him, It is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. He quotes a verse. And then in verse 12, He says, uh, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And He quotes a verse. He's quoting out of the book of Deuteronomy. He quotes Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. And Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. Jesus is able to quote these verses because he knows and has memorized them. Know the word of God. And finally this, know your adversary. Remember, Satan knows verses too. Satan is quoting verses, chapter 4, verse 9. And he, he, led, him to the, he led him to the temple and, and he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and he said to him, if you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written. Satan quoted a verse. It is written. He shall command his angels concerning you. So Satan knows verses too, but he twists them. He's a scripture twister. He twists scripture. And look at the last verse here. Verse 13. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. He wasn't done with Jesus, and he's not done with you. He leaves you for a while. You might be doing good right now. He leaves you for an opportune time. What does that mean? He's coming back. He's coming back. He's not done with you. Your struggle is not over until you die and go to heaven. But in this life, it's all about battle. Stay vigilant. Stay vigilant. He's coming for you at an opportune time. So, we looked at confirmations of Jesus' messianic claims. We hadn't heard from him for 30 years and he burst on the scene and says, I'm the Messiah. Believe me. Oh, really? What are your, confirm what are your credentials? What, what's, how do we know? And we have the public confirmation of the Holy Spirit descending as a dove and the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, publicly. Then we have the legal confirmation. We have Luke's genealogical, Luke's genealogy and Matthew's that give legal confirmation that Jesus is from the right family tree. He goes back to David, back to Abraham. And then we have the moral confirmation. Jesus did battle with Satan and he came out victorious. Victorious over all these temptations. And we looked at, we looked at three of them. Jesus is who he claims to be. His credentials were confirmed beyond the shadow of a doubt. Amen. Let's bow in a word of prayer as we invite our ushers forward.
Let us bow and pray for this offering. Our Father, we come before you and pray that you would do your work in our life. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, we are tempted in so many ways, in so many manners. Protect your people, Lord. Young believers, old believers, protect us all from temptation. Help us to know your word, to be able to do battle, and be able to say, it is written in the word of God that we might use the word of God as a shield to protect us, as a light to direct us, and as comfort for our souls. Father, now we pray that you would bless this morning's offering. We pray that you would use it, multiply it. Thank you for the faithfulness, the consistency, Lord, of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.